Hi, my name is Chip Hardwick. I am the Interim Executive for the Synod of the Covenant, and I want to welcome you to this Good Friday service. This day which reminds us, which brings us to the most pinnacle day, one of the most pinnacle days in Christian history. So glad to be offering you this service. It is filled with Synod Commissioners as well as the Executive Committee of the Michigan Black Presbyterian Caucus. We are so glad to be working together to develop this worship service for you. And I'm so grateful for all of the musicians and all of the readers and everyone who has contributed to this service. The service is basically a service of scripture, music, and art. You will hear the words of Psalm 22, of the servant song from Isaiah, and of two chapters from the book of John. They'll be interspersed with singing and with art. I invite you, when you see the pages of art, to pray and reflect on what you have heard in the scripture that's come before. We're so grateful again that you're joining us for this service, and I would invite you to join me now in prayer. Let us pray. Great and gracious God, today we are overwhelmed with your love for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, his journey to the cross, his willingness to go through everything he went through for us and for the world. And so God, we lift up this service. We pray that these scriptures would come to life for us and that because we are worshiping together, we would live more and more into the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue and the one in whom he delights. took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. 
Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. brothers and sisters and the midst of the congregation I will praise you you who fear the Lord praise him all you offspring of Jacob glorify him stand in awe of him all you offspring of Israel for he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted he did not hide his face from me but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing His love for me and through eternity. reading from the book of Isaiah, beginning in chapter 52 at verse 13 and concluding in chapter 53, verse 3. Hear these words from the message translation. Just watch my servant blossom, exalted, tall, head and shoulders above the crowd. But he didn't begin that way. At first, everyone was appalled. He didn't even look human. A ruined face, disfigured past recognition. Nations all over the world will be in awe, taken aback, kings shocked into silence when they see him. For what was unheard of, they'll see with their own eyes. What was unthinkable, they'll have right before them. Who believes what we've heard and seen? Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand, one look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, we thought he was scum, but the fact is it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, 
all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures, but it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him, on him. I am reading from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 9. Indeed, he has borne our illness and our sorrows he has carried. But we had reckoned him plagued, God-stricken and tormented. Yet he was wounded for our crimes, crushed for our transgressions. The chastisement that restored our well-being he bore, and through his bruising we were healed. All of us strayed like sheep, each turned to his own way. And the Lord brought down upon him the crimes of all of us. Afflicted and tormented, he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a ewe mute before his her shearers, he opened not his mouth. By oppressive judgment, he was taken off. And who can speak of where he lives? For he was cut off from the land of the living for my people's crime, bearing their blight. And his grave was put with the wicked and with evil evildoers his death. For no outrage he had done, and no deceit in his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 10 through 12. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see the light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet, he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord.
these words from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, the first 14 verses. After he said these things, Jesus went out with his disciples and crossed over to the other side of the Kidron Valley. He and his disciples entered a garden there. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus often gathered there with his disciples. Judas brought a company of soldiers and some guards from the chief priests and Pharisees, and they came there carrying lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus knew everything that was to happen to him, so he went out and asked, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was standing with them. When he said, I am, they shrank back and fell to the ground. And he asked them again, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you, I am. If you are looking for me, then let these people go. This was so that the word he had spoken might be fulfilled. I didn't lose any one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter had a sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And Jesus told Peter, put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the company of soldiers, the commander, and the guards from the Jewish leaders took Jesus into custody. They bound him and led him first to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest, that year. And Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it was better for one person to die for the people. I'm reading from the Good News Bible, John, the 18th chapter, verses 15 through 18. Now listen to the word of the Lord. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. That other disciple was well known to the high priest. So he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest's house, while Peter stayed outside by the gate. Then the other disciple went back out, spoke to the girl at the gate, and brought Peter inside. The girl at the gate said to Peter, Aren't you also one of the disciples of the man? No, I am not, answered Peter. It was cold, so the servants and guards had built a charcoal fire, and they were standing around it warming themselves. So Peter went over and stood with them, warming himself. The word of the Lord.
John 18, 19 through 24. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or in the temple. Where all the Jews come together, I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. John 18, verses 25 through 27. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, Therefore unto him, Art thou not one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, said, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By then it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not want to enter the palace because they wanted to eat of the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and he asked, what charges do you bring against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have brought him to you. Pilate said, take him then and judge him by your own laws. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked him, or have people been talking to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests turned you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. 
If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, replied Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Those who believe in truth, listen to me. What is truth, replied Pilate. And with this, he went back out to the Jews that were gathered and said to them, I find no basis to charge this man, but it is your custom for me to release one of yours at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him, give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. This is taken from the book of John, chapter 19, verses 1 through 16a. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power to either free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified.
I am reading from John chapter 19, beginning at verse 16. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers crucified Jesus. They took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fill the, what the scripture said. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing, they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine and a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture that says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, 
asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of the crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never being used before. And so because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Amen.
This is the cross that held the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship God. This is the cross that held the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship God. This is the cross that held the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship God. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. I led you out of slavery into freedom and delivered you through the waters of rebirth. But you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy mortal one, have mercy upon us. Forty years I led you through the desert, feeding you with manna on the way. I saved you from the time of trial and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy mortal one, have mercy upon us. I led you on your way in a pillar of cloud and fire, but you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I guided you by the light of the Holy Spirit, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I planted you as my fairest vineyard, but you brought forth bitter fruit. I made you branches of the vine and never left your side. But you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I poured out my saving water from the rock, but you gave me vinegar to drink. I poured out my life and gave you the new covenant in my blood, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy mortal one, have mercy on us. I gave you a royal scepter, but you gave me a crown of thorns. I gave you the kingdom and crowned you with eternal life but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy mortal one, have mercy upon us. I struck down your enemies, but you struck my head with a reed. I gave you my peace, but you draw the sword in my name, and you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I opened the waters to lead you to the promised land, but you opened my side with a spear. I washed your feet as a sign of my love, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, Holy Immortal One, have mercy upon us. I lifted you up to the heights, but you lifted me high on a cross. I raised you from death and prepared you for the tree of life. But you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy Immortal One, have mercy on us. I grafted you into my people Israel but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy mortal one, have mercy upon us. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. Thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And you have made a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. <laughs> 